Thank you, Caroline. Um, once again, my name is Barbara Lang. I'm a speech pathologist with Holy Family Hospital, uh, which is a rehab center for adults 55 years and older here in Vancouver. Um, I have worked in adult rehab for almost 30 years now, and um, I thank PSBC for inviting me to talk to you today to share some of what I've learned over that time with you. Um, I understand the audience is quite mixed today um, from people with Parkinson's disease and their family members to um, healthcare professionals outside of speech pathology as well as my colleagues within speech pathology. Um, with such a varied audience, I'm hoping that everyone can go away with something today of value to them. Um, up until about 10 years ago, Parkinson's disease clients formed a very small part of my caseload in outpatient rehab at Holy Family. And usually the referrals we received at that time were for people in advanced stages of the disease with um, fairly severe communication problems who were not technically regarded as rehabilitation candidates. Um, Things have changed radically over the past several years and primarily because of the popularization of the notion of neuroplasticity, that is the capability of the brain to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections in the face of injury or disease. Um, things have changed so radically that now almost half of the referrals that re we receive at Holy Family for outpatient speech pathology are for people with Parkinson's disease so that neurologists and geriatricians, family practitioners are all recognizing the value of this service. Um, certainly things have changed radically in the area of physical exercise and physical therapy in Parkinson's disease. Um, we've seen many, many programs, fabulous programs sprouting up all over BC and especially in the lower mainland. Um, these exercise programs typically, um, along with them, we hear a mantra of exercise, exercise, exercise. And certainly research seems to indicate that exercise is beneficial in Parkinson's disease for a lot of reasons. Um, is the same kind of exercise or some similar kind of exercise as valuable in improving and maintaining speech in Parkinson's disease? And this is a question that I'd like to address today. We know that speech and voice are um, issues in about 90% of people with Parkinson's disease. Typically, though, the likelihood of experiencing changes um, in speech and voice increase across the time course of the condition, but there isn't a strong relationship between speech features and limb and motor progression in Parkinson's disease. So can we say the same um, about exercise and its value to speech and voice? Well, this seems like a sort of a negative response. My response is not likely, but what I'd like to talk about is that there are many things that are valuable to um, improving speech and voice in Parkinson's disease. Exercise alone, works for a very small group of people in my experience. Um, the vast majority of people that I see need something more than a simple exercise program. And the reason for that is that par Parkinson's disease is a very complex disorder and it's more than a motor impairment. Um, this is what I want to address today. And um, I'm going to start by talking about the speech mechanism. Um, I guess it's fairly obvious that speaking is very dependent on breathing, but I think to, we, we, it's less self-evident that our swallowing also depends on our breathing. Um, our coughing depends on our breathing. So um, in Parkinson's disease, speech is affected in a lot of ways. I'm going to first of all just explain normal breathing and on the left of the page here, you see that when we are breathing in, what we do is we contract our diaphragm, we expand our chest by contracting inspiratory muscles between our ribs, the air gets sucked in through the nose or the mouth, down the throat, and into the trachea through open vocal cords that are at the top of the trachea into the lungs. 
when we're uh, exhaling, what we're doing is relaxing our diaphragm, contracting the expiratory muscles between the ribs so that the air gets exhaled up through the trachea, up through open vocal cords, up the throat, and out the mouth or nose. When we're speaking, we're using all of the same muscles. And so uh, what we're doing is we're using air during exhalation and we are pushing that air up through the trachea where the vocal cords sit on top of the trachea. Now the vocal cords are like, they're similar to little rubber bands that um, hit one another. They close when we're making voice, they close over the top of the airway, they vibrate against one another and they set the air in above them in the vocal tract, the throat and the mouth into vibration. We then shape that air using the, uh, or shape those vibrations using the articulatory muscles, the, the throat, the tongue, the, the jaw, the lips. Um, so there is um, a lot of, uh, a lot of ways that the speech system can be affected in Parkinson's disease. Um, Let me go back. Okay, so how is speech affected in Parkinson's disease? Um, uh, as I said, about 90% of people with Parkinson's disease have some impact on their voice or speech. Uh, normally, uh, it, if speech is going to be involved, it begins with what we call hypophonia. Hypo meaning less than normal. And so it's reduced movement of the respiratory muscles and the vocal cords and reduce coordination of breathing with speech that results in a, a quiet voice. Um, as far as the respiratory muscles go, we know that there is less efficient movement of the chest wall during speech and Parkinson's disease, uh, possibly owing to rib cage rigidity, but moreover we know that the lung volume at the initiation of speech for people with Parkinson's is lower than in normals. And we know that people with Parkinson's disease continue to speak beyond and below the end expiratory level, which means that at points where a normal would take another breath to speak, people with Parkinson's tend not to, they wait longer. Um, so respiratory muscles are definitely, definitely indicated in this reduced vocal loudness. Moreover, the, the vocal cords themselves can become affected by bowing, uh, where the shape changes and the vocal cords no longer uh, meet each other flush when they're vibrating. This can lead to inefficient use valving of the air during voice, so there's escape of air and voice becomes breathy or hoarse. Um, usually voice abnormalities um, in Parkinson's disease, they may or may not become part of something more broadly known as hypokinetic dysarthria, um, where the articulatory muscles of speech also become involved. And so there can be reduced movement of the muscles of the jaw, the tongue, and the lips, resulting in unclear speech. And speech can progress further to uh, include difficulties with fluency. So some people um, develop stuttered speech in Parkinson's disease. Um, it is known that the dopaminergic medications that people with Parkinson's take have a variable effect on speech. So some people report a positive benefit of their medications at maximum dosage level. Um, many others report either no change and some even report that uh, the medications can have a negative effect on speech. But communication is far more than just the loudness of someone's voice or the clarity of their speech. We communicate uh, in more nuanced ways through our facial expression and through the variation in our pitch um, and inflection. And these are both um, affected in Parkinson's disease. Uh, there is hypomemia, there's that hypo, again, less than normal movement of the facial muscles. Um, there's also a tendency to become monotone, um, uh, both affecting, once again, as I say, those, those more subtle communications. 
in Parkinson's disease, we know that postural changes and um, sometimes these uncontrolled movements or dyskinesias of, that affect some people on long-term levodopa usage uh, will affect voice projection and eye contact, uh, further impairing communication. Uh, you add on top of that the, the non-motor aspects of the condition of apathy and depression, um, and people tend to become more socially withdrawn, further affecting communication. And then further complicating everything, there are cognitive changes, and these changes make formation of or expression of an idea difficult, not just word finding. Um, it affects uh, attention, memory, executive function, so the, the ability, ability to initiate communication and plan what you're going to say. And uh, this is all even more broadly affected by fatigue. So knowing that communication depends on very complex interplay between cognitive factors, verbal and nonverbal modes of communication, um, it's no wonder that exercise on its own is not going to totally address the issues in Parkinson's disease. Um, there have been key developments, though, in the treatment, non-pharmaceutical management of Parkinson's symptoms. And surprisingly, uh, these originated with a speech pathologist who developed the Lee Silverman voice training program, which probably many of you are familiar with, or LSVT. Um, LSVT was started in the 80s. It's been researched broadly, and uh, they have shown that it is uh, an effective treatment for the hypophonia and the hypokinetic dysarthria that I've mentioned, the hypomemia, the facial expression, and I'll talk about swallowing in a bit. Um, but what they did in uh, um, LSVT was they, they applied the principles of neuroplasticity to the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So their program included intensive exercise that was meaningful and relatively simple. What they added to their program was uh, the notion of need for sensory recalibration because they found that in Parkinson's disease there was what they called faulty calibration. Um, what is sensory recalibration? Well, we know that Parkinson's disease has a sensory component. It's not just a motor condition. Um, and the theory is that sensory calibration is affected in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know that the basal ganglia, which is the subcortical structure where dopamine is produced in the brain, has a circuit role in initiating and calibrating or scaling the amplitude of movement, muscle movement needed for any particular task. And the basal ganglia is constantly working to correct our movements according to our task demands. In Parkinson's disease, the belief is that the brain is not scaling or calibrating these muscle movements accurately, and the effect is the production of less than normal movement. So we're not talking about just rigidity, but a tendency to move less even when those muscles can move. So uh, what are the implications for rehab in Parkinson's disease in the face of this, this notion of sensory calibration being, being affected? Well, um, it, the LSVT loud designers decided that calibration exercises were needed so that people could recognize and learn how much effort they needed to exert to achieve normal voice. So they couldn't rely on what they were feeling or hearing when they were pro producing voice. And um, so people needed to apply effort and needed to learn exactly how much effort they needed to apply to produce normal loudness. So people learn not only to hear normal loudness, but they learn how to feel for what their bodies need to do to produce normal loudness. And this was revolutionary because before this time, speech pathologists would treat people with Parkinson's disease in the office and, and people would perform very, very well doing these voice exercises, but there was very little carryover, what we call carryover, into spontaneous conversation. Um, 
what are carryover? What is carryover and carryover activities? Carryover is um, uh, typically a part of all rehab programs. It should be. Um, and it's essentially learning to change, in the case of speech, learning to change your speaking behavior. You use what you've learned in therapy and apply it to real life situations. LSVT was unusual in that it introduced carryover activities from the very first session and progressed the carryover activities from very simple activities such as, for example, saying goodbye to your therapist as you left the therapist's office using added effort, um, using this recalibrated voice to by the fourth and final week of treatment to using much more cognitively demanding uh, or performing in cognitively demanding situations. So for example, using your new recalibrated voice to um, give a presentation in, in your book club or to, if you're a lecturer, to give a lecture or to have a conversation at a party. Um, so what I found over time is that the components of an effective rehab program for voice and speech and Parkinson's needs to include a, an exercise component, certainly to maximize and maintain the movement of the respiratory muscles and the vocal cords so that you maximize their performance in breathing, speaking, coughing and swallowing, but that an effective program also needs to include recalibration of effort needed to attain normal or better loudness, and um, that such a program should also include carryover activities that increase in the cognitive demands put on the speaker. So um, we know that cognition impacts communication and so it should be built into the program. And certainly daily practice is absolutely essential as well as long-term maintenance of voice. So what we know of the basal ganglia function suggests that there are both sensory and cognitive issues in Parkinson's that impact communication as well as motor issues. And all of these issues should be addressed in an effective rehab program. Um, so the rehab programs available for voice, well, certainly in the United States, there are more options than in Western Canada. Um, LSVT Loud is the best known, and it's certainly part of the, uh, it's, it's mentioned in Parkinson clinical guidelines around the world and best practice. Um, LSVT Loud focuses, as I say, on conscious effort, application of effort during speech. Um, there are several SLPs or speech language pathologists in BC who have done the training, who are certified in, in providing LSVT Loud. The problem in BC is that very few agencies actually fund to offer the program. And so you may, uh, I'll be giving you a link later to on how to find a professional train, but keep in mind that they may not be working for an agency that is actually actively offering um, the program. But um, another program, when I was down in Portland last year at the World Parkinson Congress um, th that was being talked about a lot was the Parkinson Voice Project Speak Out program. Um, uh, I have, have not trained in this program. It's not offered in BC. It, it's more of an organization model. Um, but what I could see from the Speak Out program is that it, like the LSVT Loud, incorporates all of those four elements that I talked about, those um, uh, uh, components that I referred to, um, the exercise, recalibration, carryover, and maintenance. Um, so uh, both of these programs are attention to effort programs. Um, there are other programs that have been um, Research, but the research is quite scant and not very convincing on um, the few other programs out there. A lot of people are talking about singing and, and asking about singing and, and choral programs and their impact on voice and speech. I think, once again, um, singing actually uh, lends itself to the exercise, probably helps to maximize uh, respiratory muscle movement and vocal cord movement. 
Uh, it doesn't contain the other, uh, the recalibration or the carryover into conversational speech. And that's why I think though that it's absolutely fabulous for social interaction and for voice and respiratory exercise, but I, I'm not clear, there isn't uh, clear evidence that there's carryover uh, into spoken language. Um, the other area I wanted to talk about is that, you know, the programs that are out there focus on speech and voice, but we know that cognition alters the content of, of language in Parkinson's disease and can be um, uh, a primary problem. And so this is an area that up until now there's been much less focus on. Um, but I just wanted to say that, you know, when we think about conversation entailing rapid switches, for example, from topic to topic or from speaker to speaker, especially when there are more than two people involved in the conversation, it's very difficult sometimes for people with Parkinson's to switch tasks to meet the demands of conversation. That um, if you add on top of that, that, that there attention, divided attention is needed to interpret what's being said in conversation while at the same time formulating a reply and trying to gain entry into the conversation. Um, and then we ask people to then try and stay loud and speak clearly. It all becomes overwhelmingly demanding. Um, I'll say too that, that competing tasks, if you try to speak while you're walking or while you are uh, what, while you're doing some other activity, drying the dishes, that that will put further demands, and um, the capacity gets taxed through attention to formulating language and more complex thoughts. And uh, what will happen is that loudness will tend to suffer as a result, just because of the cognitive. Um, challenges in keeping up in conversation. So it's like juggling too many balls at sometimes. I guess the, um, the lesson would then be to do one thing at a time. If you're in conversation, converse. If you're, talk if you're walking, um, walk. Um, uh, the clinical guidelines in Canada outline that people with Parkinson's disease should have access to a speech therapist. And so they should for treatment of speech and voice, but in the, um, the stages where there are moderate to severe communication problems in Parkinson's disease, speech pathologists can be helpful in teaching strategies to uh, people with Parkinson's and their family members and um, also to, to look at alternative modes or augmentative modes of communication. For example, there are amplifiers that can be used when vocal loudness is reduced. There is something called speech vibe that's being uh, researched in the States right now that is a device for people with unclear speech to wear that provides auditory feedback that the, they then speak over and it's been shown for some people to improve uh, the intelligibility of their output, but certainly there needs to be more research done into that. But speech pathologists can be helpful also in providing listener-oriented suggestions, so for family members, caregivers, um, uh, to help with what they can be doing to uh, arrange the environment in such a way that the, the challenges to the person with Parkinson's are minimized. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about swallowing because it is in the, the Canadian guidelines that people with Parkinson's should have access to speech therapists um, for management of swallowing difficulties. Certainly in BC, both uh, speech pathologists and occupational therapists in the community are involved in, in uh, assessing swallowing. Um, Swallowing is a very complex um, mechanism that I'm only going to really brush over lightly today in my explanation, but it does include voluntary and reflexive muscle action. It has both sensory and motor components, 
and it is coordinated with respiration. So um, the muscles that we use for uh, swallowing have to work in a very rapid, very coordinated way to do two things. First of all, uh, to propel food from the mouth down the throat and into the esophagus so that it reaches the stomach, while at the same time closing off, protecting the airway so that no material is aspirated. We call it aspirate, aspiration when material enters the airway during the swallow. We describe different stages of swallowing for ease of explanation. Um, and any or all of these stages might be affected in Parkinson's disease. And certainly there are, um, there are overt signs of what we call dysphagia. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. So during the oral stage, you can have reduced control of saliva, liquids, foods, medications, um, because of reduced range of motion of the lips, the tongue, the jaw. Um, in addition, there is uh, drooling is quite common in Parkinson's, primarily they believe because there is reduced frequency of swallowing. So it's not that there's more saliva, there's just reduced frequency uh, of swallowing in Parkinson's disease. Um, so during the oral stage, uh, you can have escape of food from the mouth. Eating can be very slow. There can be reduced or disorganized movement of the food through the mouth. So the food may stay in the mouth for a long time uh, before the swallow as well as after the swallow. Um, during the pharyngeal stage, the point at which the, the um, swallow reflex gets triggered, uh, there can be a number of problems. Uh, the initiation of the reflex can be slow. There can be reduced movement of the swallow muscles, uh, resulting in inadequate airway protection and in, in inadequate clearance of the throat during the swallow so that you can feel that there are pills or food sticking in the throat. Um, there can be regurgitation of food, coughing and choking both during and after the swallow on liquids and solids. Uh, sometimes people will have a gurgly voice even though they're not coughing during the swallow. And that's an indicator too that perhaps there is a swallowing problem. There can also be during the esoph uh, esophageal stage of the swallow um, sensation of food sticking in the throat or the chest because the food has not moved out of the esophagus and this can be uh, also followed by regurgitation. Sometimes people feel like they get they feel full quite early on in the meal because food is not moving through the esophagus. Um, it's interesting to note that up to 50% of patients with Parkinson's disease have some symptom or symptoms of dysphagia, but that in studies they've shown that as many as 90% of people with Parkinson's disease showed impaired swallowing behaviors on objective instrumental studies of swallowing. Once again, there is that sensory component in Parkinson's which causes people to uh, have difficulty sort of monitoring uh, and sensing what's going on with their bodies. Um, and once again, the severity and the duration of Parkinson's disease does not predict the presence or the severity of the swallowing disorder. Um, I guess in all this, uh, what I'm saying is that it, the swallowing needs to be, it, there can be subtle, subtle changes in swallowing and it's good to sort of uh, uh, be aware of that. Um, can swallowing um, change through exercise? And this is, you know, the happy answer is yes, that, that there is, although there's limited good quality evidence, there is evidence that swallowing does improve through use of exercise. Um, and I won't go through them all, but LSVT Loud, um, they did a, a research, preliminary research study, and it was quite some time ago, but they did show that there was improved uh, oral phase of the swallow that the timing of the swallow reflex was improved and that there was improved clearance of the throat after the swallow um, or during the swallow. 
uh, after people had done the LSVT loud program. So there is some indication that swallowing can change even from doing a voice program. Um, if you look at the second point here, the effortful swallowing, this is a sort of a compensatory technique that's used. And once again, that's that effort that we saw in LSVT or the intent used in, in the uh, Parkinson Voice Project Speak Out, if you swallow with intention, with effort, with added pressure, you can, and it has been shown, you can clear food more readily from your throat during the swallow. Um, this effortful swallowing can be uh, uh, taught as a therapy technique, and it's particularly effective when there is uh, some sort of biofeedback. So we use, uh, where I work, SEMG, which is uh, uh, gives feedback from muscle activity during the swallow, and people um, with Parkinson's attempt to produce more pressure during the swallow um, using feedback. But there's also video-assisted feedback that some therapists use um, using a um, um, fiber optic endoscopy. Um, the third point, EMST, is expiratory muscle strength training. So once again, those expiratory muscles, um, uh, breathing, speaking, swallowing, they're all connected. Um, there has been research done where people do this, this muscle strength training, um, and they found that there's increased uh, movement of the muscles of the pharynx during the pharyngeal stage. There's reduced penetration and aspiration during the swallow and the cough uh, volume acceleration is improved. So it improves the cough response as well. So the cough being very important to clear material that is aspirated from the airway. Um, I've used range of motion exercises with patients who are um, uh, drooling, and I'm not sure, I mean, range of motion exercises have been proven effective uh, for um, lingual or tongue movement, but uh, um, I'm wondering if there is some sort of feedback that it provides to people um, uh, that allows them to remind themselves to swallow more frequently to reduce drooling. Um, certainly, too, in looking at swallowing, we look at strategies, uh, so arranging the environment in a way, once again, to reduce distractions so that when you eat, you eat, you're not doing other things. Um, not watching TV while you eat or using your computer or reading the paper. And sometimes positioning is very helpful. I have one client who said that he started to use a very small fork so that he limited because he had uh, dyskinesias that would make it hard for him to control how much food he put in his mouth. So he would use a smaller fork to control the amount of food he put in his mouth. Um, Many people, even just being conscious of the kinds of textures that can be more challenging, can um, just uh, exercise more care, uh, either avoid taking those textures or exercise more care when they are taking those textures. So oftentimes um, mixing liquids and solids in your mouth can be more challenging because it requires a high degree of coordination and timing to chew solid foods as you're taking thin liquid, get, which gets pulled by gravity much faster down your throat. Uh, so there's a lot that can be helpful um, in swallowing. Um, the resources, there are excellent educational re resources on the PSBC website. You're probably all aware there are handouts on communication, voice, and swallowing, um, which are, are wonderful. And then there are many other Parkinson's organizations that post information regularly, both handouts and webinars on communication and swallowing. Um, uh, as well, PSBC offers its uh, communication and swallowing workshops, which I would recommend that anyone who hasn't attended attend um, when it, it's offered near you. Um, how do you find a speech language pathologist if you're looking for one? There are both in BC publicly funded and private services, and there is the um, 
BC Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists website has a section on finding a professional in your area. Um, as well, Speech Language and Audiology Canada has a list on their website. Uh, PSBC has a link to LSVT trained therapists on its website, but once again, that, that list is um, probably not complete or uh, at least, you know, these people who are certified may not be working for agencies where they can offer the um, LSVT program. Um, Telehealth is, uh, you know, not something that is being used right now to any extent for treatment in BC for Parkinson's and communication issues, but I think in the future it may be uh, a, a very viable way of providing service. Uh, LSVT has also looked at developing a virtual training program. It is, um, I think, for a lot of reasons, it's it's difficult to to develop a program that's going to work well, and uh, I haven't seen that marketed, and uh, um, so I'm not quite sure where it's gone at this point. I know there's a group in Germany uh, we met at um, the World Congress who were working on developing a digital training system for treating dysarthria, um, uh, general dysarthria, speech disorders, and. Um, they're running into the same sort of issues as the LSVT people did in developing their software. So that is not yet a viable alternative to do virtual training. Um, my personal lessons that I wanted to share with you today is that exercise is usually not enough to improve or maintain voice. It can be very, very effective, though, in improving swallowing. Um, that uh, perhaps also there is a role in doing preventive voice exercise very early after diagnosis. They do know that um, uh, there are subtle changes in vocal loudness and in the range of motion of the articulators that they've identified in people very early on in Parkinson's before they have any perceptible change in speech. So perhaps doing some sort of preventive exercise um, uh, for voice and speech is a good idea. Um, but for people who already have symptoms of voice and speech, I would say a program that has a recalibration component and carryover practice is essential. Um, that people with Parkinson's should see a speech pathologist if, if they have uh, swallowing problems, if they suspect swallowing problems or have speech and voice issues, but that therapy also will require independent daily practice. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, uh, my spouse or I don't feel like doing exercise. Once again, we know that uh, apathy, it's dopamine. It's all dopamine driven and so, uh, um, we do try, and when we see people at Holy Family, we do try to encourage them to participate, um, even if they don't see speech and voice as a priority. Um, knowing, too, that in any therapy program you do, maintenance is required, so the long-term maintenance is considered to be about 15 minutes of practice a day for maintenance of speech and voice. Um, the other thing that I've learned is that don't take it for granted that your voice issues have to do solely with Parkinson's disease. It is a good idea if you, if there's been a significant change in the quality of your voice to ask your GP for a referral to an ear, nose and throat specialist. There are a lot of other things that can affect voice other than Parkinson's disease. Um, and then, um, Avoid dual tasking. It's far easier to walk well when you're just walking and talk well when you're just talking. Um, finally, to meet the needs of the Parkinson's community in BC, I think we need more speech pathologists who are trained specifically to work with this population to understand the sensory component and the cognitive components uh, that affect people with Parkinson's disease beyond motor impairment, that LSVT Loud is still considered the best researched program for voice, but we do need more focus on the impact of uh, cognition on communication in treatment. 
um, that we need communication maintenance programs throughout the province and telehealth needs to be funded um, so that uh, agencies can actually provide services that are, are needed by the Parkinson's community. Um, finally, um, I just wanted to say that talks like this tend to focus on disease and symptoms and disability and it's easy to lose sight of the things that are really important. Um, I, have, I continue to be inspired by the clients that I work with um, they share their stories, they share their insights, and they share their humanity with me. And I think ultimately, you know, maybe the mantra should change. One of my patients came in recently and told me his neurologist told him, uh, well, now the mantra is uh, exercise, be social, and continue to stimulate your mind. And so we are whole human beings, and, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, I thank you for listening in today, and uh, my references are here, and uh, I'm open to questions now. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. Um, we did have one question come in. Um, does sipping water during meals help? Um, sipping water during meals can help certain people. What you're doing with the sips of water, sometimes people will sip water before they start to eat to get um, to sort of prime their swallow reflex if initiation of the swallow reflex is an issue. More often people are using liquid during meals to try to wash food down off of the base of their tongue and out of their throat. And yes, it can be very helpful. What I think is that you should probably keep the liquid and solid, for most people, separate so that you chew and swallow your solid foods. Normally try and dry swallow and then follow with a liquid wash, so sipping water. So yes, it can be very effective. Okay, and then I have another question for you. Um, generally, how much would it cost to see a speech language pathologist and what is the process of seeing somebody here in BC? Um, if you are um, lucky enough to be around a publicly funded service, uh, then you would uh, for places, rehab centers like Holy Family Hospital, we require a physician referral. It can be your family physician or your neurologist. Um, uh, so you can have your, your doctor refer you. Um, in community health, uh, uh, there, there are um, services around the province and typically only a portion of their caseload is dedicated to adults to begin with. And um, uh, uh, so their wait times for adult service tend to be long. Um, but I, I'd suggest a physician referral. Um, I think the issues, what I'm hearing is that often people are too far away even from their local, you know, the service that is closest to them to really uh, uh, allow for regular travel for therapy. And that is an issue. Um, if you are uh, seeking private service, the cost tends to be about $120 an hour. Um, there are some extended medical plans that will, if you are lucky enough, they have some limited, very limited coverage. Um, okay. Uh, when I first sip, okay, there's a question here. When I first sip water or eat food, my voice becomes weak and hoarse. Why? Um, there, uh, that's a good question, and without meeting you, I would have difficulty answering that. Uh, I sometimes do see people where there can be a little bit of penetration of the water, so penetration being entry into the very top of the airway above the vocal cords um, uh, in small amounts and that can sometimes affect 
voice when sipping water. Um, so I, I would suggest assessment um, if you have access to it. Uh, next question. My husband has been doing LSVT therapy for two years. It helped a lot, but he developed hoarseness a couple of months ago. ENT says the vocal cords are fine, but he doesn't want to practice exercises and his voice has become much softer. Any ideas? Um, I think this is where um, uh, uh, actually trying to use that recalibration component. Often when I see people in follow-up and ask how are you practicing, there's a percentage of people that say, oh, I'm doing voice exercises. So typically they'll be doing these, these, these ah sounds um, and holding them for as long as they can. Like I say, the, it, it goes well beyond doing voice exercise um, and uh, it does involve sort of applying effort when you speak. Now, you say that um, the voice has become hoarser over time and the ENT says the vocal cords are fine. Um, voice can be affected by the uh, uh, two things. Um, voice can be affected by the speed of the air going through the vocal cords. And so you can have what a, sounds like a weak voice, hoarse voice, um, not because the vocal cords are not vibrating against one another, but because the speed of the air through the vocal cords is not adequate. Um, the other thing is that sometimes there can be changes in the way the vocal cords are functioning that an ear, nose, and throat specialist might not see by simply scoping. There is an exam called stroboscopy which looks at, at their light flashing. Um, it almost is like a, an old uh, silent movie where it's frame by frame where they can see changes in the way the vocal cords are functioning. Uh, most ear, nose, and throat specialists, specialists do not do as a matter of, uh, you know, their typical exam, the stroboscopy, but there can be an effect on the vocal cords nonetheless. Um, I would say as a suggestion, um, have you, to try calibrating, so effort, and typically in LSVT, people assign a, a number to an effort level that they use um, and apply to their voice to achieve a better loudness. And so that is the cue then to themselves, am I using this, let's say, six out of 10 effort level to uh, get a better voice? And uh, so people learn to use increased effort when they're speaking. I hope that's helpful. Um, next question, my GP referred me to an e ENT practitioner and a speech therapist. I had a swallowing assessment done and therapy exercise training within six weeks of seeing my GP, all at no cost. Very impressive. Yeah, that's great. Any more questions? At what stage of Parkinson's is it worth starting LSVT? Um, well, the people who designed and researched LSVT recommend that uh, people do it as soon as they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And um, I certainly, at Holy Family, we see people with Parkinson's disease in a team screening um, for the very first visit and where people come referred for physiotherapy only. Um, what I typically do is, uh, if people are not complaining of voice issues, I will offer them uh, sort of a, a mini therapy program with a few sessions to establish a voice 
exercise routine. And as I said, what they're finding now is that the um, loudness of the voice is they're, they're discovering changes very subtly early in Parkinson's disease. So imperceptibly to the person with Parkinson's and to those around them. And uh, they're starting to look at this as possibly an early indicator uh, of Parkinson's. So uh, would it be valuable to do exercise from the get-go? It may be. So um, the next question, what's the name of the ENT test? Well, uh, the, the one that I just mentioned was stroboscopy. Um, the, where they look at how the vocal cords are moving under a flashing light. Is the, I, I think that's the answer to your question. Any tips for a caregiver in communicating with the patient? I'm going to refer you to the handouts on the PSBC website under resources. There is a, a whole Print out. You can print it out, uh, a PDF on communication um, strategies, both listener-oriented strategies and speaker-oriented strategies. So they're under communication. Um, uh, there's one on general communication. There's a handout on voice. And there's a handout on swallowing on the PSBC website. My husband, next question, my husband has been self-calibrating using voice analyst app to check his numbers. Very difficult to self-calibrate. Yes, and um, the thing about using any external measurement, there are lots of uh, uh, sound level meter apps that people are using. Um, Self-calibrating can be very difficult for the person with Parkinson's disease, it's for sure. Um, and so it may be that at a certain point, people require reminders from their listener to that they're not speaking loud enough. Um, definitely, these external devices that give you measurements are helpful, um, but at the same time, we know that there is a problem in self-cueing in Parkinson's disease. And if we don't have any more questions, then we can call it a wrap there. Um, I would like to thank everybody for uh, sitting and listening today. That was incredibly helpful for myself and hopefully for you. So thank you very much, Barb, for coming. Um, just a friendly reminder that this will be recorded and it, you can watch it again on our website if need be. And we will be having another webinar um, June 20th, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And as well, um, just a friendly reminder about our Moving Forward Together conference in June. And thank you all very much and I hope you enjoy your Tuesday. Take care now. <laughs>